I'd like to ask you, if you would, to grab a Bible or a device by which to access the Scriptures and turn with me to the book of Philippians, a book that, if you've been a part of the community here at Coastline over the last few months, you're, you're very familiar with. Um, but Philippians chapter 3 is where we plan to spend a little bit of time this morning. You know, as Pastor John just mentioned, um, I personally am super excited about the next two Sundays and the Sunday thereafter, where we really do give time and attention to cast that net, as was mentioned last Sunday, in a message about being fishers of men. Um, This Sunday kind of is just a, a part two to that message, as it were, if you could call it maybe living new life in a new year um, would be kind of how we would theme or focus our time both last Sunday, the last Sunday of 21, and this Sunday, first Sunday of 22. And today we plan to be in Philippians chapter 3, and you may ask why. Well, every year, as long as I can remember, New Life Christian Fellowship, Calvary Chapel, Gulf Breeze, Coastline, whatever name you know our community by, has typically closed the office the week in between Christmas Day and New Year's Day. We really believe it gives the team, the staff, and just even the facility time to breathe, time to rest. That's a good thing to do as you kind of close one season and begin a new one, is to reflect, to pause to pray, to process, maybe to plan. And this week affords what I think is really precious time for our staff to spend time with family. And I don't know about you, but do you get a little bit of a fog after the Christmas New Year's? Like, oh my goodness, so many pigs in a blanket, so much, you know, Welch's grape juice, whatever it is you were doing. Um, it's just like, oh man, I need a, I need a moment. Well, This week affords kind of the team here at Coastline Gulf Breeze that opportunity just to not have anything on the schedule, not have anything planned. For me, it gave me the opportunity to kind of spend a lot of time on our local national seashore. I don't know if you ever checked that out. I'd encourage you not to do so, so that way I can have it all to myself. But um, it's a beautiful space, all this, this area that we live in, whether it's the national seashore on the beach. I mean, that little reprieve of homes between Navarre and Pensacola Beach, that's phenomenal. The little patch of grass that we have in between proper and here, oh, let's keep it. Uh, I love it. Um, But having the week off and having warm weather, I'm not wearing a long sleeve hoodie, I'm wearing a short sleeve. Tomorrow that'll change. Um, It afforded me a lot of time and opportunity to just think and pray, and, and some of that which I was praying for was just this morning's message. Um, I even listened to a number of past messages that we've given here over the last 18 months, um, just praying about what to share. And I had a message I intended to share on how to live new life to the fullest. I was even going to kind of reference our, our vision statement. And in, in the foyer, if you don't know a lot about our church, you'll, you'll see this graphic come up on the screen in just a moment about how you can access a document that really gives a little bit of clarity as to who we are and where we see and sense God moving us and how we hope to go about that in the next 20 years. Should we live past today, right? As the Lord wills. And it was a message that was really focused on, listen, if you want to live well in the 21st century, year 2022, spiritually speaking, it's going to involve a dynamic that's both individual and community. It, it, it involves a dynamic that I would say as an individual, you must come to grasp with the gospel of who Jesus is, that he is Savior and Lord. Like if you want life to be lived the way it's intended, you must first receive that good news that you need someone to pay your sin debt. That may not sound like good news if you've not yet been initiated. But for those that are saved, those that are forgiven, those that are finally given sight after being blind, to recognize that there's a Savior, that there's someone who can forgive me, that wants to know me, that's created me. That's phenomenal news. 
And God has no grandchildren. You must come to him as an individual and receive him personally. And that's where life begins. But there's another G, and I would call it glory. I think you should live a glorious life. Like Maximus in, in Gladiator or whatever, like for glory in Rome. What? You should live for king and country, but not your own. And this is the challenge as an American Christian. You live in one of the richest countries in the history of the world. And you're constantly tempted to live for your own glory, your own kingdom. I'm in that boat with you. But the greatest thing you could do with your life is to enjoy God by glorifying Him and living for the good of others. If you want to live life to the fullest as an individual, it's gospel, it's glory. But then thirdly, it's growth. It's growth. God loves you so much, but He doesn't want to leave you where you are. He'll bring blessing or bummers, mountaintops or valleys, whatever it takes to see you move forward. God's desire for you is growth development, fruitfulness, not living life on loop, but on a journey. I think that's how, as an individual, you want to live new life in a new year. It's, it starts with the gospel. It's a recognition of the right kind of glorious life to live, that it's not for us or for someone else, it's for him. But then it's about growth. And then in community, well, you might already know what I'm going to say there. There's three other G's. We gather together weekly to worship and love Jesus. We group together to connect. And everywhere we go, we're looking for Walter. Does that make sense? We're, we're, we're living on mission. But I'm not going to give that message today. So I just heard it. Well, good. You got it. Maybe that's for another time. But I was thinking and praying and in National Seashore, I received a text from a lady that used to go to Coastline Destin years ago. I'll never forget this family. Number one, they had four daughters. I know what that's like. But on their very first Sunday of visiting the church, the, the mother and the oldest daughter were involved in a horrific car accident that afternoon. They had filled out a Connect card Sunday morning. They were a military family new to the area. And it didn't look like their oldest daughter was going to make it through the night. That's how horrific it was. They were both unconscious. And we got the call. They had just shown up to church that morning. And by God's grace and that season of the church, we had such a wonderful connect team and care team. And they were there for months. They were there ministering to this family. This girl, she was kind of in her early 20s and had a military career pathway of her own that she was most likely going to excel in because of that accident that, that, never, um, that never came to fruition. By God's grace, they both pulled through, continued to live in the Destin area for a few years, and then got restationed to just a terrible place called Hawaii. I don't know if you're familiar with that place. But I got a text from her yesterday. She usually texts my wife and I. And it's not uncommon to get a couple texts from her a week, just encouragement or scripture or pray for us or this or that. And this is all she sent in the text. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward for what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And she quoted the chapter and verse, Philippians 3, 13 through 14. And as I was in that you know, area where there's no kids or, you know, maybe a few animals, but just quiet, national seashore. I felt a strong impression. This is for tomorrow. Okay, well, then I got to pivot. I've got to adapt. I'm going to have to write a sermon. <laughs> um, see, this morning, I want to share four life lessons that God has given to me from this scripture that continue to teach me on this journey that I'm on. And interestingly enough, this is the verse that was given to me when I was born, Philippians 3, 14. I want to share a disclaimer, though. This isn't a new message. You say, what do you mean? Are you just rehashing that series, Jesus is the Key to Joy? No, this isn't content from that series. But some of what I'll share this morning, I shared on the very first Sunday as the pastor on September 20th, 2020. 
but even so, I feel it's needed for today. So this morning, I'd like to do two things with you, if I, if I may. I'd like to spend some time in Philippians 3, verses 12, 13, and 14, just to get context, share four points of application. And we're going to kind of begin a new rhythm here at Coastline on the first Sunday of the month. On the first Sunday of the month will be the Sunday that we take communion together. Some of that is pragmatic for us. You know, if you've been around Coastline for a while, on the third Sunday of every month, we do a food drive and we do communion, and often the student ministry joins us. Well, just with some logistics of things, with with all those different dynamics, it just works best for us to start the month with communion and, and focus that third Sunday on those other things. So it's kind of appropriate as we begin this new year on this very first Sunday of the year, At the close of our service, Pastor John will lead us in communion, but I do think it plays into the message that I'm about to share. And so this morning, it's really two things I want to get into God's Word with you, and this won't be a breakdown of all the content that's in Philippians 3, 12 through 14. There's so much there, but four life applications that if if you can hear me on this, if I can see your eyes, I personally believe are life-changing and life-giving, but only if you live them daily, daily. Persistence is what wins the day in your spiritual growth. God's Spirit is not weak, is not lack. God wants to do so much in you and so much through you. And I think some of these lessons that Paul will share with us this morning from Philippians 3, I hope they encourage you. I hope they exhort you. But at the very least, I hope they show you the grandeur of Jesus, who He is, how much He loves you, what He's done for you, what He longs to do in and through you. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, I'd just like to read them pray, and then begin to kind of look at these four life applications. Verse 12 says this. This is Paul writing to a church that if you've been with us over the last few months, you know he loved dearly. But he wrote this. I do not mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No. Dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling me. Father, I pray as we spend a few moments together this morning that I would be able to serve you and serve your people well. Jesus, would you just exude from the page this morning to the hearts and minds and attitudes and choices of your people. Bless them, I pray, in Jesus' name as we read and study this word together. And Holy Spirit, we ask and pray that you would teach us. And God, I just pray that whomever is in this room or in another room connected to us, perhaps listening to this content at a later time, I pray you'd bring sustainable life change to them through your son, Jesus. I pray that in Jesus' name, amen. You know, if there was one thing that the Apostle Paul was passionate about, it was the purity and the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you're to give any time whatsoever to observe this historical character known as Saul of Tarsus, who changed his name to Paul and then ended up writing most of what we have canonized as the New Testament, you would, mu- you would have to surmise this guy believes in Jesus, the power of the gospel, and he's going to fight for the purity of it. Because even at that time that Paul is writing, first century There was already false information, fake news about Jesus surfacing, different opinions, different agendas, very much like the culture you're in now. And Paul was willing, and history kind of gives us this 
possible understanding of what he was like. He wasn't like a six foot four special ops guy. He was kind of short, balding, and had a hooked nose, is what most, most people believe. But he was this guy who was ready to go toe to toe with anyone on the purity and the power of the gospel. That if there was anyone that would come against or detract from who Jesus is and who the church can be, he's right there, writing. No, 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 I'm writing from prison. Tell them this, tell them that. He fought for this reality that if your faith is in Jesus, you're justified, you're forgiven, you're declared righteous. God doesn't hold anything against you. Read the book of Romans, read the book of Galatians. Over and over and over again, he's saying, listen, no, if you're in Christ, you got a clean bill. You're forgiven. So many people walk around defeated as believers, I think, because I think they still think, well, i got to do for God to be. No. God's pleasure in you is not based upon your performance. God's pleasure in you is based upon the performance of His Son. And that is done. God's not mad at you or upset with you or wishing that you would produce more. He loves you. You are in Christ. You're forgiven. You're justified. Your standing before Him is secure. Paul would fight for that, but there's a second thing that he would constantly fight for, and it's kind of what the text talks about today, the fact that through a life to live in Jesus, you can experience freedom. That's called sanctification, growth, development. Listen to me. Let, me. let me see your eyes. As a believer, you can experience freedom, hope, joy, peace. Romans 14, 17 says the kingdom of God is these things. That this is the life that has been bought for you by pure and spotless blood. Paul would fight for these things, justification, sanctification, and both are relationally oriented. And this is what Paul is describing in our text today, sanctification. You say, what does that mean? It's God progressively separating a believer from sin to himself and transforming his total life experience towards holiness and purity. That's God's agenda for you in 2022 to continually separate you unto Him and transform your life by His Spirit so that you could experience holiness in purity. Freedom from sin, worry, depression. God wants that for you. Now here's the dynamic. We have a very active part to play in sanctification. It is not, well, God's done it, so I just don't do anything. Look at the text again with me this morning, verses 12 through 13, and we'll look at our first point of application. Just a few things to take note of. He says in verse 12, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things, that I've already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers, in verse 13, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past. I'm looking forward to what lies ahead. Here's the first life lesson I'd like to share with us this morning and then just unpack it a little bit. We don't have it all together, figured out, or settled. And that's okay. That's okay. Welcome to the human race. You don't have it all together. Every box doesn't get checked. See, Paul doesn't define maturity as perfection, but growth. Our life and our walk with the Lord is about progressive growth, not squeaky clean perfection. Kids are always asking, are we there yet? Always. Doesn't mean if it's time for breakfast or what. Are we there yet? Is it time? They're always asking that. Let me share this with you. No, you're not there yet. And that's okay. You're right where you're supposed to be. See, listen, here's the point. We are being made. We're not done. Spiritual giants of previous generations understood this. Listen to George Mueller, 
who had an orphanage. So he must have really understood a lot of kids. Listen to what he said. Just as a little child is a perfect human being, but still is far from perfect in all his development as a man, so the true child of God is perfect in all parts, although not yet perfect in all the stages of his development in faith. See, this is the difference between justification and sanctification. Positionally in Christ, you're made whole, you're pure, you're holy, you're spotless, you're blameless. Practically, in life, you're walking through sanctification, where God is progressively setting you aside unto Himself by the power of His Spirit to call you into purity and holiness. Listen to what Charles Spurgeon said of this. He said, But while the work of Christ for us is perfect, and it were presumption to think of adding to it, the work of the Holy Spirit in us is not perfect. What do you mean? It's continually carried on from day to day, and we will need to be continued throughout the whole of our lives. You know what this means? You haven't arrived, and that's okay. And don't put that expectation of arrival on anyone else. We all know this truth. Hey, everyone's a sinner. But in a gracious way, is that how we treat one another? Say, so what do you mean? Do we have unset or unmet expectations upon others to reach a standard that they're not really empowered to reach perfectly every single day? Where we place expectations on others to always perform? Be free from that. Recognize, listen, everyone's a sinner. Everyone is going to miss the mark. Listen to what Billy Graham said. He said, each life is made up of mistakes and learning, waiting and growing, practicing patience, and being persistent. We don't have it all together, figured out or settled. And that's okay. You're walking through sanctifying growth with the Holy Spirit. See, listen, we're all going to fall along the way. But falling is not failure. Failing is refusing to just get back up. This new year, this new day, as Pastor John mentioned, I want to encourage you. You have an opportunity to start fresh with Jesus. Personally, let the gospel identify who you are. If you've never been baptized, I want to encourage you on that Sunday, I think it's the 23rd, not only sign up for that, but understand that baptism is this public obedient thing that we do to declare that we're forgiven and set free. And I want to encourage you on Sunday morning that when we have this baptism, to celebrate with those. Because it's a monumental thing to communicate to oneself and to those around that I belong to Jesus and I'm forgiven and I'm set free. Number two, live for God's glory. Listen, in your activity, you are going to be living for the glory of something or someone. You will. Your brand name, your name, your boss's name. Live for the name that's going to last, the name of Jesus. And everyone lives for glory. Everyone, you're designed to do it. Make sure it's focused on the right person. Start fresh with Jesus in that way. Let the gospel define you. Let your activity be about God's glory and commit to grow. Grow. You know, tomorrow we start our Daily in the Word program for 2022. There'll be brochures out in the foyer as we start Genesis chapter 1 on Monday. Daily, consistently reading God's Word is one of the best things you can do as a Christian believer. But collectively, gather with God's people. I mean, you may be approaching 2022 and say, okay, in this year, as Pastor John is going to be offering these next two Sundays, I have an opportunity for people to respond to a public proclamation of the gospel. Invite your friends. When we gather together, love on one another, connect together. When we group together, Pastor John mentioned this earlier, but next Sunday night we'll be hosting that facilitators and hosts meeting for connect groups. 
Connect groups is one of the most vital ways in your life as a believer that you will grow. And here's the funny thing about connect groups. It won't be noticeable at first. Relationships built over time that are consistent provide the most stability and fruitfulness for you as a believer. But it's not instantaneous. It's not like you join a connect group and go, man, I see all the benefits. No, no, no. But keep showing up. Even when you don't feel like it. And over time, you will experience koinonia, fellowship, that ability to say, man, those are my people. Those are the ones that are going to show up at the hospital. Those are the ones that know me. Connect with God's people. And lastly, we'll have different ways in which we can go into the daily life that we're given to live on mission. But that marriage conference that we're putting together at the end of of this month And I would encourage you to invest in your spouse. When Pastor Jim and Christy come, it'll be a wonderful opportunity. Because here's the reality. We don't have it all together, figured out or settled. And that's okay. That's the Christian experience on planet Earth. Progressively growing. If the Apostle Paul can write this, then you and I are in good company. Anyone else ever written any part of the New Testament? If you have, we have a back room. We'd like to talk to you. There might be some challenges there. No. If the Apostle Paul can say, listen, I'm still in process, I'm in there too. And so are you. The second thing I want to share with you this morning, it comes from verses 13 and 14, but this is the phrase I would say. It's not about doing less, but about having the right lens. Like we live in a culture that idolizes simplicity and complexity. But you know, at the beginning of the year, there's always that, well, I'm going to stop doing this, start doing that. There's always that dynamic. And that's not to say that some things in your life you may need to do less of. One of the beautiful ways to actually concentrate and move forward is to eliminate that which distracts. So don't, don't misunderstand me. But as you live your life with Jesus, it's not about just saying, well, I'm going to do less of this, less of that. No, it's about having the right lens on life. Again, look at verse 13 and 14. He says, dear brothers and sisters, I've not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. I'm forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I'm focused on Jesus. What does this mean that Paul says this one thing I do? It's a filter. It's a lens on the life that you lead. Oftentimes, we can approach life like a big list, and maybe we put God at the top, but if you approach life more like a list than a lens, it's so easy to leave God at the top and then do everything else in your own strength. But a lens is something by which you see everything. How you treat your spouse is a ministry. How you parent those children how you organize and lead a business. The work that God has given you is not meant to define your value. It's a platform for you to worship Him. The work that God has given you, the way you approach it with your attitude, your care for others, this is how you serve Him. Whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, Paul would say, do it as unto him. It's not a list, it's a lens. And this kind of lens leads to ultimate contentment. Take your Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 4 real quickly. I want to read a couple sets of verses in that chapter, verses 11 through 13, and then verses 19 through 20. See, the right lens on life, that lens of everything is lived for Jesus, It's the kind of lens that leads to ultimate contentment in life. Look at verse 11. Paul writes this. Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who strengthens me. Look at verse 19. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all of your needs from his glorious riches 
which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Now all glory to God our Father forever. Amen. Paul did not find or discover or arrive finally to a place of contentment due to his location, vocation, circumstances, or cash balance. Ultimately, contentment is a recognition that God is the one who supplies my needs, and I trust him. But here's the beautiful thing about Paul's contentment. There's no complacency there. See, real contentment is not being complacent with what you have or where you are, saying, well, things will never get better. I, should, I guess I should just be happy with where I am. This is the lot that God's given me. Change my name to Eeyore. No, that, that's not contentment. That, that's, a, that's a false perspective on life. Real contentment is not about being complacent with what you have or where you are, but it's giving your best and trusting God with the rest. Say, God, everything you've given me to steward, I'm stewarding it to the best of my ability, and I'm trusting you with the fruit. I'll take care of the root. You take care of the fruit. Real contentment is working diligently for God's glory and the good of others. You've got to have that right motivation. There's a lot of hard workers out there, but it's not necessarily for God's glory and the good of others. That's why they're miserable. A work ethic doesn't produce contentment, the right vision, the right why behind that work ethic does. See, real contentment is this prayer that you probably know. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. It's not about doing less. It's about having the right lens. Third application point comes from verse 13, where he says, forgetting the past. And I would put it this way. Learn from the past, but don't live there. Learn from it, but don't live there. In the negative or the positive. What do you mean by that? What matters most is now. What's right in front of you. Honor what God has done. Don't just despise the past. I'm not saying that. Learn. Honor. But live in the moment you're in. And to the best of your ability, steward the future as best as you can. Hindsight is clarity. Foresight is always fuzzy. It's only in now that you see perfectly the way you can. See, here's the thing. Don't ever stop building monuments. Don't ever stop remembering what God's done. But also, you've got to approach each new season as a new season. We don't want to relax in past victories. We don't just want to live in past failures. You know, I'm in a text thread with a men's connect group from our church. And one of the guys sent this message in a text thread that I'm in. I'm just going to read it to you. It's got scripture littered all the way through it. He first starts with Isaiah chapter 43, verses 18 through 19. This is what it says. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And this is what this guy says. Guys, let's remember today that God is doing something new. Nothing in all creation is stagnant. Everything is continually changing. All is moving forward according to his will. And then he quotes from Revelation. He says, Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Revelation 21.5. And he's referencing our Daily in the Word program. He says, It's like we read yesterday from Revelation 22. He who is faithful, the witness to all these things, says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And he closes this text thread this way. As we enter into 2022, let's celebrate that God is making all things new, that he's coming soon. That is at any moment. Let's move forward in our walk with him and together as the body, the body of Christ. No matter what happens in 2022, our future is secure. He is making all things new and nothing in all creation can ever snatch us out of his hand. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. So yesterday I got that text message, and I got the message from the lady in Hawaii. Oh, that's what the people need to hear. 
What? Learn from the past. Don't live there. You don't have it all together. Not everything's settled. Not everything's done. That's okay. But when it comes to the past, don't be Uncle Rico. Do you know what I mean by that? The guy who could always made it to state. If they just done da da da. And let it go. Let yesterday go. It's done. Live now. Because in just a moment, now will be over. And wherever you are, be there. Be there. Don't pine for the future or long for the past or shoulda, woulda, coulda. Be here now. You can only be alive now. Doesn't that sound so simple? You can't be alive five minutes ago or five minutes from now. You're alive now. So live now. Live to the hilt for the glory of God. Fourth and final observation, life application for this morning, comes from verse 14 where he says, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. And I'd put it this way. It's not about easing off. It's about pressing on. It's tempting to think that you eventually won't be tempted anymore. Maybe not completely, but just to begin to relax, to put your trust in the momentum of your success. Paul had been a Christian nearly 30 years at the time that he's writing this. Planted a bunch of churches, even saw Jesus, wrote most of the New Testament. And you know what he says at the end of his life? Finally, I can relax in my prison cell. No. Finally, I can just enjoy the fruits of my labor. No. He says, I press on. Paul is still going for it. See, I think maturity could do with a little bit of rethinking. The Bible indicates that maturity is something that you're always pursuing, but only reach when Jesus calls you home. And as you get closer to the finish line, You've got to press in and press on. It's easy to get into a rut. That's the natural thing. So after a while, it's almost like physical fitness. You've got to do something different to shock those spiritual muscles back into an awakened state. Try new things. Here's something new you could do. We need some kids ministry volunteers if you'd like to sign up for that. Um, No, here's what I mean. Sometimes we can live life almost on loop or in rut and say, well, this is how God's gifted me. This is what I do. I think God is amazing. If you're willing to step out and try new things, you'd be amazed at how he meets you right where you are. And I'll just be honest with you. I'm not going to live life on a loop, in a rut. I've done that before. It's miserable. I want to follow God wherever he leads. He'll never lead outside of his word. So thankful for that because it gives us an anchor. I've shared this statement with you before, but one of my mentors said, Neil, always think outside the box, but never outside the book. I want to keep pursuing Jesus. I want to not ease off. I want to press in and press on. I want to live now. I don't want to live in the past. I want to learn from it. I want to celebrate it. But I don't want to miss what God's doing right now. And I recognize that in my own life, whew, you get to know me. Neil didn't have it all together, figured out or settled. That's okay. It's right where you're supposed to be. See, these life lessons from Philippians, I don't really know why felt such an impression to share these with you this morning. Maybe it's just something that I need to be reminded of. Maybe there's one other person, so I needed to hear that. And it's not about my perfection, but it's about Jesus's. I needed to to hear that, that I've got to stop living in what happened yesterday, either the good or the bad, and press into what he has now. But here's what I would say. And I want to go ahead and close our service um, and just invite the the worship team to come up. And in just a moment, Pastor John will prepare communion 
elements for us and lead us in that. But I want to say this. You just never know what's coming for you. Life is so short. And I really do believe that the life that Jesus hung on a cross for was not just so that you could get into heaven, live hell on earth and just get into heaven. I don't believe that. I believe eternal life starts the moment you surrender to Jesus. Because eternal life speaks more of a quality of time than a quantity of time. It's not just about, oh, now I can live forever. Got it done. Check the box. No. It's about a life lived surrendered to Him. And it's filled with joy and peace. It's about serving others, living for God's glory. And living as you've been designed to live. To live well. I'm super excited about 2022 and what God's going to do in our fellowship and through us. As Pastor John mentioned, we're going to be in a a series for the next couple of weeks simply focused on the gospel. And starting in February, we plan to start navigating the book of Revelation throughout the winter and spring and on into the fall and even on into 2023. Super excited to dive into that book with you guys. Pastor John and I will kind of continue that same rhythm we've been doing the last year or so of tag team teaching. But I think God's got something really special for us as a church as we just gather together, study his word, group together to build relationships and go to reach a lost and dying world. And that's for us as a community, but also as an individual. I just really believe that God wants you to thrive. He's paid your debt. You're justified before him. By the power of his Holy Spirit, he wants to sanctify you and grow you and develop you. But that takes partnership on your end. Say, how do I do that? You've heard me say this a million times. A, B, C, right? Attitudes, beliefs, choices. What do those look like? That's how you begin to partner with the Lord. And you can do that. You don't have to have a PhD or even a GED to do that. You can change your attitude. You can believe the truth. You can make choices empowered by his spirit that's aligned with his word. And let me have your attention. Let me see your eyes. Here's the whole amazing thing about it. It's for your benefit. God's word, his commandments are not his bummers. They're his enablements for life. Enablements for life. And there's so many people in 32561, 32563, 32566. Let's just focus there. That man, life is not being lived well. They don't know where they're going when they die. And God wants to use you to share this good news. Through your work ethic, give glory to God. So it's, what what are you doing? Why do you work that way at that job? God wants to use you in 2022. He wants to bless you, but he wants to use you to bring more people into a life-giving relationship with his son. I want to encourage you. I want to exhort you. I want to call you to follow him surrender to him, to let go of vain pursuits, and to live for something that matters. That's why you're still alive. So I hope and pray that in the year 2022, you see growth and development. You'll have your losses. You'll have your wins. But you constantly keep pressing on and pressing in. Because truly, and we're going to see this in the book of Revelation, the best days for us, church, are truly ahead. Our faith is secure in the creator of the universe. 